Alrighty, Cherub. So today we're going to talk about the neoclassical, and this is going to be the last thing that we, our last stop in this unit of study. Next time, when we begin with the uh, the Romantic period, we're going to be talking or beginning a new unit of study. So this is our last uh, unit of study. We are going to have a test after this, and it's going to go from the Renaissance through the neoclassical. Now, in the neoclassical, you need to understand that life in Europe is changing on account of the Enlightenment. Okay, so we're going to be start with a new branch, new branches, new thinkers of, of gosh, philosophers, um, scientists, the Enlightenment are changing the way people are viewing the world. People are moving to cities uh, and new nations are emerging. All right. The Enlightenment, like I said, is happening and artists are becoming more prominent members of society. All right. The salons in Paris are going to be extremely powerful. And the academies of Paris are going to be extremely powerful. Now, what you need to know, how the neoclassical happens. So we're coming out of the Baroque and the Rococo. The Rococo doesn't touch everywhere. Um, but we're coming out of this period of this big, ostentatious, very flowery, over-the-top style art. And so a desire happens for to pare down, to simplify, to become less big, less in your face, less um, theatrical. People start touring. People from England and Northern Europe start going on what's called the Grand Tour. And they are going to start art history during this time period becomes a thing um, where the first person to write down the lives of the artists that's coming in the Renaissance that happens in the, in the, the Mannerist period. But art history is kind of starting to become a thing as of the, this neoclassical period. And so people are going to start to go on the grand tour. They're going to go and hit the cultural hotspots. They tourism, art tourism begins where they need to go and see um, the Colosseum. They need to go see Notre Dame. They need to hit um, the sites. Okay. And as people start up in Northern Europe, they wind up down in Rome and when they wind up down in Rome, they go through Florence and they'd look at all of this great Renaissance stuff and this Roman architecture and the Renaissance architecture. And they start to realize like, oh, this is cool. So they want, there's a desire to, to revisit these things. It also happens, like I said, when you have writers who are writing about the art of the ancient world, about Greece and Rome, like J.J. Winkelmann. Okay. He is going to, and we're going to link this clip so you can give a watch on who Winkelmann was, but he was an art historian, one of the first art historians and kind of the first guy to, to make art history big. And so he's going to write about the Greeks and the Romans, and he's going to wax very eloquent about the beauty of these statues and these buildings and why they need to be studied. Okay. It's coming from him, the idea, because he's going to believe that the classical sculptures were white and he's going, so our belief that they were white comes directly from J.J. Winkleman. Okay. Um, lastly, Pompeii is discovered and Herculaneum are discovered during this time period. And so there's going to, they're going to uncover Roman frescoes that had never most of our understanding of Roman painting comes from Pompeii and Herculaneum, and they exist because they were preserved by the ash of Pompeii. Um, statues, architecture, houses, all of these things that were just obliterated during the Middle Ages uh, were preserved by the volcano. And so much of our understanding of the Roman world happens because of Pompeii. And so there is, again, this great interest, like, ooh, suddenly Roman things were very, very cool. Greek things were very, very cool because of Pompeii, right? They're going to study um, the classics in architecture and go back and look to Renaissance architects, okay? And focus again on that balance, the harmony, because the, the grand theatricality of the Baroque and the soft fluffy silliness of the Rococo is going to be seen as mm, too much. Now we want something pared back and serious 
and simple. And so we're going to go back to Greece and Rome. So neoclassical is again, art made to a formula. It's a thinky movement, right? In painting, they're going to look at historical and mythological and biblical scenes, and they're going to be painted, though, with a modern context in mind. And so the idea here of exemplum virtutis, that they are going to teach a moral lesson through art, that art should be a propaganda for goodness, that or what is perceived to be goodness, okay? That's going to become popular in the neoclassical. So art is going to be used as propaganda for good, exemplum virtutis, and that and giving a virtuous example, all right? And it is, let me go back here for a second, art, they're going to believe that art painting should have a very clear message, and it should be symmetrical, it should be harmonious, it should have this invisible brushstroke, which we'll see. It should have very clear Renaissance-style lighting, no more tenebrism. Okay, and it's going to be staged and it's going to look like it's staged to the point of artificiality. Okay, um, neoclassical art has this very distinct look, and we'll take a look at some examples here. So, they're going to believe that um, because of the Industrial Revolution, the price of bronze is going to fall, but the price of marble is going to go up. And so they're going to misunderstand ancient sculpture and think because they've gotten so much more examples of marble that that's how it was, um, that marble was the preferred material when the ancients really believed that bronze was the preferred material. So in the neoclassical, they're going to sculpt in marble. And they're also going to believe that this sculpture was white, like I said. And so they're going to sculpt this beautiful white marble and leave it like, like that. So we've got three pieces today to discuss. We've got a French and two American pieces, right? So in France, this is going to be a direct reaction to the Rococo, um, the art of the neoclassical um, Jacques-Louis David is going to very directly and very purposefully react against the neo, excuse me, the Baroque, where it's going to be... Um, here, let's take a look at this example. This is our piece is called the Oath of the Harati. Jacques Louis David, eighteen or seventeen eighty four. So just a few years before the revolution, this this painting is actually influential in beginning discussions of revolution. So what you see here, it's a Roman story. That's gonna we're gonna see that play out a lot, where they're gonna create pictures based on old Roman myths and legends and stories. So the idea is that before Rome was even a republic, before it, well, it was just this, a city state, before the days of the republic, before the days of the empire, when it was just a city state and they were trying to claim their place in Italy, they came against, a, were a, in, they came into conflict with a, with a neighboring culture, a neighboring tribe. And the to stem the the so they fought these wars with this neighboring tribe and to stem the loss you know the of life they just said okay look we're gonna pick our three best warriors you pick your three best warriors winner take all okay um and so that's what's happening in this picture the father here is swearing his sons because that all the three best warriors of the romans are these um their brothers Okay, his father is swearing his sons to act courageously and to bravery and to arms. Okay, the problem is that the sisters are married to the enemy. So no matter who wins, they lose. Okay, so what's happening here is you can see this very clear Renaissance lighting. You can see the influence of the Michelangelo, the very cleanly sculpted forms. There's nothing flowery. There's nothing Rococo. There's nothing feminine about this. It's very hyper masculine. And David paints in this hyper masculine way, very purposefully. Um, and anything that is considered to be feminine or uh, emotional is kind of pushed off to the side and like, no, no, that's not cool. That's not any very 
clearly mocks that sort of thing in his works. Um, all of his pieces are about, again, these, um, this revolutionary fervor, you know, to reclaim the fatherland, to make France pure again. Okay, and that's what this picture is very much about. Okay, let's zoom in on this so we can see it just a little bit better and see some of the details that are happening here. Again, now David painted, he's so funny because he would paint the models completely nude. And then he would paint clothes on them. So because he wanted the anatomy correct. And you can tell he was a master anatomist. Jacques-Louis David was very, very good. But you can see what I'm talking about, how it's staged. It looks like a play. Um, it, it looks, the emotion is like over the, the top in what it's doing. The women with their feelings are like, oh, swooning. So again, it's not meant to be an emotional picture in that way, like flowery, um, girly emotion. It's meant to be very strong, uh, like patriotism. Okay. And that's where, he, what he's going for with this picture. I'm going to link these videos. You need to watch these. And this is about the Oath of the Harati and Jacques-Louis David, and just to get a better sense of what he's doing and what he is about. Okay, so the idea is, again, that it's an exemplum virtutis, that the function of this picture is to make sure that you understand how to be a good, they're looking back to Rome, well, what a good Roman citizen would do in the present. How do you be a good French citizen? Okay, by eschewing effeminate luxury, by eschewing, by getting rid of the ostentatious display of wealth that you should pare down and simplify your life and be a good man. Okay. And that's the point of this picture, right? So it's going to be created and uh, displayed. It's created in 1784, displayed in 1785, and it's going to be a sensation. All right. A uh, little video, a little for fun, kind of talking about the French Revolution. Now, the British, uh, I just throw this in here so you can kind of get a sense of what's happening over in Britain, and then we'll get to America, because Britain is absolutely going to influence America because we're coming here at the time of the revolution. That's when this is all happening, is the time of the American and the French revolutions. So, for example, we get the Colbrookdale bridge, the iron bridge. So they're going to use this Roman style arch, but they're going to make it out of iron. We'll get this very new modern material, make this, but they're going to look back to the past. So it's this Roman arch, but they're going to use iron to do it. So they're looking very purposely back to the past, but giving it a modern twist. The Chiswick house near London, you can see how, again, it is inspired by uh, Palladio. It's inspired by Renaissance architecture. It's inspired by Greece and Rome. You're getting the pediments and the porch with the broken staircase, though that's kind of baroque. Um, but then the dome. All right. So you can see here that this is clearly uh, a throwback to the to the Renaissance. Okay. Angelica Kaufman is going to paint this very. Um, neoclassical picture again exemplum virtutis so it's a roman story so we have this roman mother who is the mother of these two important the gracchi brothers who these important um they become senators later in their lives um and she is um being asked by a friend her friend shows her her treasures her her jewels her brings out her jewels and says look these these are my treasures where are yours and Cornelia, the mom, points to her children and says, yes, my children are my treasure. They, I have no jewel that is more important to me than them. And of course, they grow to be great Roman senators. So the idea being that we should, you know, good family values type of thing, that we should cherish our children and invest in them and because they are the future, that sort of thing. So again, a Roman picture to how do you be a good British mother today? Okay, example virtutis. 
Now in America, they're absolutely going to be influenced by the British, what's happening in Britain and what's going to be happening in France. So we get the, um, I mean, this time is the time of the American Revolution. And so we're looking all Washington, D.C. is a neoclassical city and is very intentionally designed to be that way, to have to hearken back to the Greco-Roman past to show off um, that it, the democracy, again, the democracy, the republic, these are all ideas floating around in their heads and like, yes, we're hearkening back. We are the new Rome. We are the new Athens. Okay. So these ideas are very much present in their minds as they write the constitution, as they write the declaration of independence, as they build Washington DC from nothing. They're looking back to a classical past and taking inspiration therefrom. So you can see the colonnades, you can see the tholos, you can see the dome, you can see all of these things. So for example, St. Peter's Basilica is going to inspire St. Paul's Basilica in Rome, and it's going to be built um, just in the Baroque period, but then that's going to inspire the um, Capitol building in the United States, which is going to inspire the Utah Capitol. So you can see how there's this very direct link to the past, uh, very to our own place and time. Uh, we hearken back to these symbols and we do that because it's all linked. And St. Paul's, or excuse me, St. Peter's Basilica goes back to the, the idea goes back to the Hagia Sophia, which in, then goes back to the, the Pantheon. Okay. So it's all related in this direct lineage of these buildings um, comes and is visible. And we do things today because people did it in the past and we're creatures of habit. In the Washington, uh, in the Capitol building, and I loved this, how that in the, a Corinthian style column, and we talked about this when we talked about the Corinthian columns in Greece, but they use, they're based off of the leaves coming off of or an acanthus leaf. Now, acanthus leaf comes, or acanthus plant comes from Greece. It comes from the Mediterranean. We don't have acanthus plants in America. And so what they did for the, the capitals in the Capitol building is they made them new world plants. So they did tobacco leaves and tobacco is a really beautiful uh, plant. Here's an acanthus leaf, but a tobacco is this very beautiful plant, but they use tobacco leaves on this capital, which is very cool. And then they use maize, they use corn for the capitals over here. So again, looking to the past, but incorporating the present. And that's kind of what neoclassical is. Um, it's not just a slavish copying, it's a remixing, okay, of Greek and Roman, as well as Renaissance. So again, you can see the Supreme Court building, a Corinthian temple. You can see the porch on the White House with the alternating pediments and tympana. Okay, so again, harkening back to the Renaissance, with the Ionic columns. It's so good. And of course, the Utah Capitol, which is done with the Corinthian colonnades, the engaged columns, and the, the dome inspired by the U.S. Capitol. Now, the piece that we're going to be looking at is Monticello. Um, Monticello was the house, is the house of Thomas Jefferson. And you can see how, and you look, think back to the Chiswick house that I showed you in England, how this is very much inspired by that, where we have a pediment, a porch, a tim, or excuse me, uh, another pediment above the doorway. You've got a dome. You've got this... Um, balustrade up at the top which kind of obscures the second story a little bit and it's a brick house but it's accented with that classical whiteness so thomas jefferson is the architect of this house it's his house on his plantation and it is used as his primary residence um the floor plan here so you can see it's it's symmetrical you walk into the front and we got the the entrance hall and we've got the the library and the bedrooms and the kitchens and the dining rooms okay and so you've got this very and he was very conscientious of his space as he designed this this house okay um for example, the stairways, there isn't a grand staircase. He uses spiral staircases to get to the second floor. So he doesn't have to take up that room with this grand ball, you know, this Baroque style staircase. It just get in and get what you need to do and do it with the spiral staircase. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to link this. It's a tour of Monticello. And we like to say Monticello here in Utah, but it is not in fact true. It is Monticello, which means little mountain in Italian, and because it is going to be on a hilltop. And now, again, it's the chief building, uh, it's the chief residence on Jefferson's plantation. Thomas Jefferson is the architect that builds this. We've got that brick uh, exterior with the stucco applied to the trim to give it the appearance of marble. It isn't marble, but they want to give it that appearance. We've got those tall French doors and windows to allow in the summer breeze because Virginia is hot and it is humid. And having been there in the summertime, it is miserable. So you want <laughs> any air movement that you can get. Again, that octagonal dome because he's looking back to the classics, but he's remixing it in the present. So he's absolutely going to be inspired by the Palladio, who's going to be this Renaissance architect. Now, the thing about Monticello that we have to discuss, and um, is especially since it's come out very recently, that there was a secret room planned in Monticello, that he designed a secret room in Monticello, and it was there that he his mistress would give birth to their children. Now, his mistress was Sally Hemings, his slave, okay? And this is important to discuss, that um, he, after his wife died, he took his slave, who was 30 years younger than him, to Paris, um, and had children with her okay and it's so there it's extremely <sighs> problematic um it's extremely problematic and it's extremely uh difficult america is nothing if nothing else america is complicated and um we have a complicated past and one of our founding fathers one of the people that we look to as the good old days, you know, had children by his much younger slave. And there's so many problems with this in a secret room that he designed purposefully next to his bedroom. Um, so many problems with this, and it's so problematic. And I invite you to do some digging on this, that I'm going to link um, question, you know, videos about the hidden room and about, you know, articles that talk about this and, and the, the problematic legacy of Thomas Jefferson. Okay. Um, it would be super easy to bring, you know, to the, come to this class and just talk about the building and okay, it's his house and he designed it. But I think we do a disservice to the past when we whitewash, literally, the problematic areas, and when we don't discuss the problems of race that we have in America to this day, and if we don't come into it with open eyes and realize America is complicated, America has problems. And we need to have an open dialogue and an open discussion without rancor and without malice about how we can move forward together as a people. And I think that so, so important that art history gives us that chance and that opportunity to have this discussion without, um, you know, it, it begins here and it begins with talking and naming Sally Hemings and naming her children. So this is our final piece here is going to be for the um, Virginia State House it is going to be a commissioned statue by um, Houdan, a French sculptor, Thomas Jefferson, not Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, excuse me. 
that George Washington here is going to be depicted. And he's going to be depicted as a statesman. Um, again, this is neoclassical. And it's neoclassical because it's done in marble and it's done in white. And it's done where it is giving, it's presenting him as a proud figure from the past. As a proud, and it was 1788, so it was, he was alive when this was sculpted. Um, but it's presenting him as a statesman and as a leader, very much like um, the Augustus of Prima Porta. Okay. And he's going to include symbols and things that indicate its neoclassicalness. So, for example, the, the thing, the column that he is leaning on, this is a Roman symbol. This is called the fasces. They're bound rods together. With, it's a symbol of the Republic. The idea that you can't, you can break one stick, but you can't break all of them when they're together. Okay? Um, that he is holding a walking stick, not a sword. His sword's over here. That he's not holding it actively. Now, the idea this this sculpture here gives us the idea that he it is it is not hyper idealized. That he is a little bit more robust uh, in in the waistcoat, for example. That he is not um, a, a flawless human, but absolutely a human to be admired. He is also wearing on his lapel, it's called the Badger Cincinnatus. It's a Roman medal. It's a Roman like medal, an award from the days of the Republic. Okay. So this is going to sit in the Virginia Capitol building. And of course it is a propaganda piece because it is hearkening, it's connecting the present to the classical past. Okay. Uh, there are some missing buttons and it is a tight vest on him, but he is portrayed as, as, a dignified man of enlightenment as a statesman, okay? As a gentleman, all right? He is portrayed as humble. This is very, very much like the Augustus of Prima Porta, okay? He, it's, there is a plow behind him, and he leans on that faces, like I said. The 13 rods symbolize the colonies, and he leans on the colonies, and he gets support from them. So it's going to be... Um, of an accurate, considered an accurate depiction of, of uh, Washington. Do Thomas Jefferson at the time was the ambassador to France and is going to pick this artist, Houdin, to be the artist to capture in stone the likeness of George Washington. Okay. And that is the neoclassical. I hope you've enjoyed this little trip. Next time we're going to talk, begin with the romantic period. Um, 